Welcome everybody uh, to the call CBPA uh, webinar, New Brunswick Historical Newspapers Project, uh, preserving and sharing our newspaper heritage online, uh, which is brought to us courtesy of the call uh, CBPA Digital Preservation and Stewardship Committee. Um, so I'm going to take a few moments. Uh, my name is Cynthia Holt. I am the Executive Director of CALL. I'm just going to take a few moments to uh, give some housekeeping uh, things. So if you're not presenting, we ask that you turn off your camera um, just so that that would help with the bandwidth for those who are in low bandwidth areas. Uh, we also ask that you mute your mic so that uh, we have are able to fully concentrate on the speaker who is speaking at that time. Uh, the session will be recorded and posted on our uh, call website and also our YouTube channel. And I will be notifying everybody who registered for the session uh, uh, once the recording and slide decks are up and available for viewing. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to take this opportunity um, to acknowledge that call CBPA represents member libraries across the region, all of whom sit on the unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. Uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador, we acknowledge that the lands on which campuses are situated are in the traditional territories of diverse Indigenous groups. And we acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and cultures of the Beothic, Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inuit of Newfoundland and Labrador. In Prince Edward Island in Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. And in New Brunswick, libraries are found on the land of the Wulastuik and Passamaquoddy peoples, uh, and also our, the Mi'kmaq peoples. Uh, we at CALL CBPA wish to express our sincerest gratitude to the first peoples who share their ancestral homelands for us, for us all. Uh, with us all. And at this moment, I am going to turn things over to Evan Eccles. Evan is the Digital Collections Archivist at UNB uh, Archives and Special Collections. He is also the Chair of the Digital Preservation and Stewardship Committee. Evan. Thanks, Cynthia. And thank you to everyone for, for attending this webinar on the New Brunswick Historical Newspapers Project. This wide-ranging effort to centralize all information and holdings of newspapers published in New Brunswick was a collaboration between uh, the, the Provincial Archives of New, New Brunswick, Council of Archives New Brunswick, and the University of New Brunswick Libraries. To discuss this project in detail, we have several of my colleagues from uh, the uh, um, University of New Brunswick Libraries. First, we have Jeff Carter, Manager, Library Systems Group. Uh, Jeff is a an uh, accessibility and UX UI pontificator, a reformed educator with a passion for purposeful and considered impl considered impl um, implementation of technology. Jeff has been with UNB Libraries doing web design and project management since 2000. Jacob Sanford is the senior technical operations manager. He studies information systems and workflows, working with a manager of library systems and um, library admin to prescribe IT sc scalability and sustainability strategies. Finally, we have Jeremy McDermott, senior web developer. Jeremy is a graduate from UNB's computer science program and has been a web designer with UNB libraries for over nine years. He has a keen interest in UX design and web accessibility. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, two presenters who couldn't be here with us today, but play significant roles in the project. That's Leah Grandy, Archives and Special Collections Assistant, and Mike Mead, Digital Imaging Coordinator for the Center for Digital Scholarship here at UMB Libraries. So we'll have time to take questions at the end of the session, but in the meantime, feel free to drop any questions you have into the chat as you think of them. And with that, we'll start with Jeff. All right. To find the right window. I believe it's that one. All right, uh, my slide deck is up, I'm assuming. It is. Great. 
Okay, uh, yeah, before we jump into the meat of the presentation, uh, just uh, to further acknowledge uh, Mike and Leah that can be here, both of those folks represent uh, uh, part of the, a larger part of, of this project, that is uh, the microforms department, uh, which is now under our archives and special collections uh, unit here, uh, and Mike with the digital imaging. Both play huge role uh, in this project, and I think both have been involved almost since the very beginning, uh, back in uh, the early 2000s. Um, so originally I was not supposed to be speaking, uh, so I am covering the slides and that part of the presentation for Mike and Leah. Uh, so uh, there's a risk that I will talk too quickly and will be too short, or I'll talk too much and will be too long. But uh, uh, and uh, I won't probably be able to answer the questions uh, in as much depth as I'd like uh, if there's questions related to those two units, uh, but I will do my best. All right, uh, why newspapers? Well, newspapers have something for everyone. Uh, students use them uh, for research assignments all the time. Uh, we have academics and researchers that do deep dives into the content within the collection, uh, either for historic research or uh, research grants and proposals, uh, they're often included. Uh, and then, of course, we have the, the pesky public that's always wandering in, wanting to see our newspaper collection, look through the old microfilm. Uh, they're doing research for something related to their family, genealogy, that sort of thing. Uh, so there's a, there's a wealth of content within newspapers. Uh, we have the world's largest New Brunswick newspaper collection here at uh, UNB Libraries. Uh, it's been amassing for centuries, I guess. Um, in 2009, we created an online uh, index to all the content that we had. Uh, primarily, that's the print and the microfilm, uh, so people could find out what papers we actually held. Uh, we have been digitally preserving newspapers since about 2010 from both our print and microfilm collections. So this, there's a long history to newspaper preservation in this province. Uh, there was a real collective effort starting in the 1980s to preserve newspaper heritage following the publication of Russell J. Harper's uh, 1961 directory uh, of newspapers in the province. Uh, following that, there were a, a lot of uh, provincial meetings that included uh, head librarians, archivists, uh, historical councils, that sort of thing. Essentially, they divided up the corpus of newspapers in the province, uh, and depending on the size of the institution, uh, they became responsible for some or several uh, newspapers, uh, basically getting them a microfilm to preserve them. Uh, there was a follow-up second edition uh, of the book in 1996, and then a couple of years later, uh, the website went online uh, that some of you may be familiar with that used to be housed at the Provincial Archives of New Brunswick. That's a little screenshot of the, the website. As you can tell, it's quite old. It wasn't updated, I think, beyond the year 2006. Uh, so uh, we've since incorporated all the content within that directory uh, in the NBHNP. Uh, if you want to see the old site, it's in our Wayback Machine, so you can still reference it. Uh, but I will note there's been a lot of research done since then uh, to update the, uh, the directory, not in terms just of uh, the number of papers in there, but the accuracy. There was quite a few errors discovered uh, as we were uh, working through this project. Uh, so this project is indeed the latest, uh, hopefully the last uh, iteration of newspapers in this province. Uh, as already mentioned, uh, we can all remember when microfilm was the future. Uh, that was going to be the savior uh, for preserving uh, our newspaper heritage. Um, hopefully, uh, the latest digitiza digitization efforts are the last uh, iteration. Uh, somebody's got their mic on. Uh, there will be no DVD release or Blu-ray box set uh, of our newspapers. Uh, there could be a neural implant, but I doubt I'll be around to see that. Uh, 
So to uh, uh, to make this project a reality, uh, UMB Libraries has been working away at this uh, on its own in parallel. Uh, but uh, I guess almost three years ago now, we decided that uh, we needed uh, to broaden the partnerships and work directly with uh, fellow institutions in the province. Uh, so we created a partnership with the Provincial Archives of New Brunswick. Uh, we have they have different resources than we do. Um, so we've kind of been leaning on each other. Uh, and also the Council of Archives of New Brunswick uh, has been a key player uh, in especially helping us gather holdings uh, for the project. And then finally, lots of local libraries, museums, and local organizations ha have been participating as well. So what are objectives? These are not official objectives. Uh, so there is a kind of uh, loose uh, objectives, I guess, for the project. Uh, the first, and you'll see this more when Jeremy gets into the presentation of the website. Uh, the first is uh, the goal is to track and document our publication history in the province uh, and track existing holdings. We want to know what people have, what did get microfilmed uh, in the 80s and 90s, um, much of which was still ongoing until very recently. Uh, and then uh, for things that have not been microfilmed, what do people have in terms of uh, print holdings? From that, uh, we want to determine what material needs to be preserved and digitized. So uh, there's a sense of urgency to some parts of this project in that uh, some original content uh, is being or will be lost. Finally, the goal is to provide access to this content. Obviously, that's changed a lot in the last 10 years. We're able to put a lot of this content online. It's not necessary for people always to come in and view the microfilm. Uh, so the digital is the primary driver when possible. We put up local digitized uh, full text content. Uh, and in some cases, you'll find records uh, in our collection that also link out to CKRN content or uh, Google or even local news affiliates. Uh, like I mentioned before, microfilm is not dead. Uh, when we get into copyright, a lot of papers uh, just can't be online and uh, not within our collection anyway, our public facing collection. So people will have to come in and access microfilm. Uh, and then finally, kind of as a last resort print, uh, people will need to access the print copies sometimes of newspapers. So there's three formats uh, within uh, the NBHNP, uh, we track uh, print copies that we have, uh, and those are ever changing. Uh, people are jettisoning print copies once they've been digitized or microfilmed. That's a whole other, I guess, discussion uh, for the archives community. Uh, then papers that have been microfilmed, uh, we've got a huge collection of those, and there's a huge collection all over the province uh, of microfilm. And then finally, uh, more recently, is the digitized copies, digitized either from the print stream or the microfilm stream. So our current focus is on digitization, uh, but uh, given limited resources, um, staff, people, time, uh, equipment, uh, we have to try and triage, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, which papers we're going to digitize. So uh, as you can see, there's quite a number of considerations to take into account. Uh, you know, is a area of the province poorly served in terms of availability of a title, uh, time range, when, you know, is it an old title, a newer title, language. Uh, I will point out that uh, UNB is, uh, for the most part, uh, unilingual English. So the focus uh, for us has always been on the English language papers. But uh, since our recent expansion, we're uh, working to begin adding uh, digitized French content to the collection as well. Uh, research popularity, this is actually uh, very important. We're an academic institution. So often our priorities are dictated by research projects that may come forward that uh, require certain titles. So sometimes we kind of have to put those to the head of the line. Availability, uh, this is, a bit of a thorny one right now. Uh, we tend to not uh, digitize titles that are available in other collections. 
Uh, so the Brunswick News International titles, if you're from Atlantic Canada, that's the Irvings, uh, are generally not found in our collection uh, as digitized full text. Uh, but recently, uh, BNI was sold to Post Media, and they have since taken down the archive. Uh, so those titles are not available anywhere currently, and that's become a real problem. Uh, formats an issue we can generally digitize uh, more quickly uh, from print or from microfilm than we can print. Rarity. Uh, this was the one of the original drivers back in 2010 when we started digitizing. Uh, is that we had a lot of papers in bad condition that existed nowhere else. Uh, and we decided we needed to start uh, digitizing them before they were lost entirely. Uh, and then there's finally uh, the huge topic of copyright, uh, which I'll circle back to here in a minute. One other question that often comes up, is it a newspaper? I will say we're fairly liberal in our interpretation of a newspaper here. Uh, you know, there's some guiding criteria. Does it have current content, advertisements, general interest topics, uh, you know, editorials, features? What are the publication interviews, intervals? Uh, and then uh, does it use newsprint? Uh, but we, we've been fairly generous, I guess, in our interpretation. Uh, all right, selection and copyright. So with respect to how we're uh, selecting materials for digitization, we tend to proceed with a focus on materials which you can reasonably presume uh, that copyright has expired. So for guidance, we have turned to the analysis requested by CKRN uh, from Clark Wilson. Uh, I'm not an expert in copyright by any stretch of imagination. I, uh, uh, we can put you in contact with our copyright officer uh, or the, the associate dean of, assistant dean of libraries here. Uh, and they can probably better answer your, your questions. But uh, we encourage you to read the memorandum that's posted on the CKRN website. Uh, this is only our reading of the memorandum, and we don't speak for either CKRN or Clark Wilson. Uh, the analysis was requested uh, specifically to assess the sustainability of a microfilm collection for digitization uh, within Canadiana. So, uh, the analysis provides a set of assumptions and the assessment of risk, which is uh, basically the main thing. Uh, and we found it very useful in making our own uh, selections for sharing digitized titles on our public website. So your, your mileage uh, will vary. Uh, in very broad strokes, uh, the analysis suggested that given the time the newspapers are published and the average life expectancies in Canada, uh, that's life of the author plus 50, now 70 years, uh, for individual authors and that the works are considered public domain. Uh, the analysis suggests in terms of risk of dispute, uh, we can consider three uh, very broad bands. So uh, the first is pre-1913. That's considered uh, generally considered probably public domain and very low risk. Uh, 1913 to 1931, moderate risk. Uh, the the material is probably in the public domain, uh, but not it's not an absolute. Uh, and then finally, anything after 1931 is considered high risk and very likely not public domain. And the risk of dispute is quite high. Uh, so for our purposes, we have confined ourselves to low risk and low moderate uh, so far. Uh, it's important to note that uh, these bands aren't absolute uh, and that there's a number of other factors that should be considered in doing your due diligence. Uh, is the publication still in circulation? Is the publisher still active? Uh, does the publisher have a history of trying to enforce copyright? Um, and is the publication being used in another commercial product? So these due diligence questions, again, if I circle back to the Brunswick News International issue, uh, are, are very real. Uh, all the publications that uh, uh, are available for those have been in, the, they're still in circulation, the publisher is still active, uh, and up until very recently they were actually used in a commercial product. Um, so uh, very much titles and issues need to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, there's just a myriad of factors sometimes 
Uh, we've had people come to us and say, oh, I'd like to put our, you know, our paper online. And uh, but it's, you know, a very recent publication. We can't get copyright uh, cleared. We can't reach, you know, all the necessary parties. So it's uh, sometimes it's not as easy as you would hope, uh, even if everybody's in agreement that it should be online. Uh, so some of the urgency, as I mentioned earlier, for this project uh, is the material conditions uh, of some of the papers that we have. Uh, we've got several at UMB here. We've got several locations of storage, some much better than others. Uh, yeah, so it's for especially for things not microfilmed. Uh, it's a bit of a race against time. Uh, as you can see, uh, People took great pride in preserving and keeping newspapers, but they didn't always do the best job of preserving them. And newspapers, unfortunately, uh, are not really meant to be preserved very well. Oops. Uh, yeah, scotch tape is not your friend uh, if you're an archivist. <coughs> uh, and this is the floor after imaging some of these uh, older papers. Uh, they do not hold up well. Sometimes the very act of preserving the paper destroys it, unfortunately. Uh, lots of fun finds. Uh, it's always a challenge to keep students and the people working on these projects moving because they keep finding interesting things to read. Uh, or uh, people's leaf collections in an old paper from 1849. Uh, and there's always kind of uh, funny things to read in the papers. This, the tagline in this paper is the only paper in the world, so far as we know, printed by a man with one hand. Not sure if that's actually true, um, but in 1901, these folks uh, thought it was. So where are we at? The project status. Uh, currently, we've got the most accurate index of New Brunswick newspapers, over 1,100 titles uh, ranging back from 1783, the Royal St. John Gazette and Nova Scotia Intelligencer. Uh, if you're wondering about that title, uh, you can look it up, but it dates, goes back to the history of when New Brunswick used to be part of Nova Scotia, 1783. Uh, and then right up to 2023 with the Frederick and Independent. We now have updated holdings for most institutions. This is where all these provincial partners have come in to play. We've been getting holdings, as you'll see when Jeremy demonstrates, from all over the province, uh, who's got what microfilm, who's got what print copies, uh, a very important exercise for preservation. We've added about 350 titles since the last version of the online directory that used to be at Pan B. Uh, we've got 104 uh, digitized full text titles with ongoing imaging. Uh, we've entered into a partnership with Canadian and CKRN to share content. Currently, it's only in one direction. Uh, they've been sending us uh, copies of things they've already digitized, so we don't have to digitize them to kind of backfill uh, what we're missing. That's proved very useful. And at some point, we'll probably be sending content in the other direction as well. Uh, we've now, as I mentioned earlier, taken down the Pan B uh, website directory for newspapers uh, because it's it's really out of date compared to what's on our website and we've uh, created a pathway so people can share uh, missing issues with us or send corrections and additions that sort of thing all right the digitization process uh, oddly this probably has the least number of slides but is uh, the most amount of work and man hours, person hours uh, in digitization. This is Mike Mead's area, who's not here today. So there's two pathways to digitization. One is from print. Uh, that's initially we had a, a T's Book Drive Pro. We had two Canon 5D Mark II cameras. In 2012, we bought a second a T's unit and moved to the uh, Nikon uh, D800 cameras uh, that were capable of 300 uh, PPI uh, images. Uh, in 2021, our sister campus at UMBSJ uh, purchased a non uh, OS 1200. That does A1 paper size, which I think is like 23 inches by 33 inches, somewhere in that uh, size. And they've been now doing digitization. The second pathway is microfilm. 
in 2014, uh, and this is where the story gets really muddy, we entered into a contract with Brunswick News International to digitize all their, or most of their big dailies. Uh, so we actually did the digitization here for them as part of the project. Uh, they provided funding to hire staff. Uh, we bought a NextScan Eclipse microfilm scanner uh, in 2014. Uh, and uh, over the course of four years, it was originally, I think, an eight-year project, but they wanted to accelerate the timeline. Uh, we completed about 3 million pages uh, of their, their big papers and put them online. If you were a subscriber uh, to any of the papers, the, uh, the TJ News papers, you also got access to the archive, which since November has been taken down by Post Media. Uh, one good takeaway was near the end of the project, we ran the, the eclipse into the ground, uh, but under warranty, we were able to actually replace it. So we have a fairly fresh uh, microfilm scanner at our disposal now. Uh, so digitizing is one step. Uh, the next step uh, involves uh, quality control. And this for us has been the real bottleneck. Uh, it just requires uh, an immense number of person hours cropping, rotating, scaling, surrogate generation, uh, all that sort of thing, preparing the images for ingest. So you don't end up with bad images like uh, it's so easy to find in a lot of the old microfilm reels. Uh, so staff then create a directory and file structure for ingest. There's a parent folder for the titles, a unique folder for each issue, and then each image uh, is numbered with the page number uh, and assembled. Following that, they create the metadata file. This is all uh, in preparation for the automated ingest. Uh, you can see a sample of the file there. So we track uh, issue level metadata, metadata, that's the publication date, the title, which sometimes varies from the original title, uh, volume issue, if there is alternative titles like a supplement or an insert, uh, and then errata. It's not uncommon for these old papers. Uh, to go to print with the wrong date on them or the wrong volume, that sort of thing. So we, we try to track all that as well. So the images line up with the metadata. Again, a tremendous amount of work uh, in these stages to get things ready uh, so that they magically appear on the website. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Jake. Uh, hopefully I can advance the slides appropriately, Jake. Uh, sure thing. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. All right. Uh, I just wanted to briefly outline and discuss the image processing portion of this project. It's kind of, as Jeff said, the bridge between the stored scans and the website itself. Uh, next. Oh, sorry. I think it's one back. Yes, it does. No. <laughs> uh, okay, so to do this, we, we have a custom processing workflow. It's built in PHP. It leverages the Robo framework. Um, currently, our assets are stored in a GitHub repository called Systems Toolkit. Uh, this is a comprehensive collection of kind of maintenance and technical scripts we use to maintain our services. I should note, if you're interested in this, we are in the process of um, restructuring our repositories where our project assets are kind of centralized more towards a place in a single location per project. So uh, some of those scripts soon, very, very soon, will move to the newspaper projects lean repository itself, which is just newspapers.lib.unb.ca. Uh, okay, next. So in the workflow, we have many actions. Uh, we can generalize them into a series of steps. I've outlined these steps here. The first step is uh, OCR queuing an issue discovery. So as Jeff said, we begin with a tree of scanned issues kind of in a standardized format. Um, we search all those subfolders for a meta file and our metadata file, and that's assumed to be kind of an issue path. And then from that basis, we check to see if there's any HOCR that's come in through the ingest process already. If not, we queue the uh, file for OCR later in, a, in the next step. Uh, and we queue here instead of kind of just simply iterating 
to optimize uh, core usage of the hardware. So since some of the issues have two to three pages only, and we have kind of multi-core systems, uh, it's not as efficient to just do OCR on it, on issues them uh, individually as we go through. We queue them up and later process them all at once. Uh, okay. Uh, next. So then we perform the OCR. Um, we do this with Tesseract 5. I uh, have a link to the Docker container we use here. Generally, we spawn between 12 and 16 Docker containers to simultaneously process the pages. And this is based on kind of the PC hardware. If we have other hardware, we can change that value. Uh, a note here, we found that if we set the Tesseract OMP thread limit to one, this showed a slight performance improvement overall versus just letting the scheduler do it in the OS. Now, whether this is some sort of complication of running multiple containers under an abstraction in Docker, which then needs to be scheduled by the system or not, I don't know why, but we do run them single threaded and we get a little bit more performance out of the process itself. Uh, and again, for efficiency, any issues are not created actually in the website until all pages have their OCR generated. So we, we just sit and let the machine churn the OCR out uh, until it's done for the entire tree we've decided to process. Uh, okay, next. So once the OCR is complete, then we kind of reiterate over the paths again, because we've stored the HOCR files in the tree with the image itself, uh, we just use those. We create an issue in the Drupal REST API. We just use a REST request to create the issue, then iterate over the pages, several more REST requests, and then finally add the OCR text to the Drupal page entities. This is kind of like a fragile process, like generating the OCR and any assets really isn't a big deal, but because we want to make sure we're only you know, generating one issue online per issue that exists on disk. We store some processing information inside the folder itself as kind of a marker that indicates the issue has been ingested. Uh, next, great. Uh, so then we generate the DZI tiles. Now the page viewer we use on the site, and Jeremy will discuss this later, uh, Open Sea Dragon, it can leverage DZI tiles and Basically what this does is minimize bandwidth and load times for the users. So technically it takes the image, uh, it divides it into sections based on various zoom levels and it pre-generates hundreds of tiles, which are just small images at various zoom levels of that image. And then when the user is viewing the image, they only have to download enough of the image to see clearly at the current zoom. So there's no need to have the tiniest micro detail if they're zoomed out at the full page view. Uh, so as you zoom in with the viewer, more data comes into the user and it's pretty uh, transparent to them. They don't even know what's going on. There's no load time or anything. It just streams in and then layers over the previous zoom you were at. Uh, then we generate some PDFs with Tesseract. Uh, we do this just simply to provide an OCR rich download option for the user. Uh, often images don't have the text. We don't have the full text exposed as a raw text download on the uh, website. So the PDF with the OCR in it allows users to download it, select text with a mouse and copy portions of the, uh, of the page that they want to if they were to copy it off. And we do all this kind of in a similar process to the OCR. I won't go through it again, but we just iterate over the folders and use Tesseract to generate the PDF itself. Uh, Tesseract has a PDF output option. Okay, next. And finally, the this whole kind of entire process is audited for accuracy. So once the issue is created in the online system, we hash the images that are in the system and then compare them to our local images to make sure that they are exactly the same images. Uh, we check page numbering, just look for some common problems that we've run into over time, identify missing assets like PDFs or if the DZI tiles were generated correctly. Just do an audit to make sure that 
everything is kind of uh, as we expect it. And at that point, we write another marker to the path in the uh, file tree that indicates that the audit has been complete and this issue is in uh, in the system. Uh, next, yeah. So of course, when if we want to discuss performance, uh, an example of what hardware we run this on might give some value uh, to those listening. So a representative item of the hardware we process these pages on is uh, here, Intel Core i9, 16 cores, 64 gig of memory. I will say we rarely exceed a 50% memory usage on this. That's a, a lot of memory. So that much memory might not be necessary. Uh, we tend to choose an amount of threads based on a, a, at about 75% of the core values. Um, we've done some experiments from you know, 50% to 100%. We found that actually we get the best efficiency at about the 75% thread uh, value. An average total of all this that I've kind of uh, gone over and discussed per page is about 60 seconds. So generating the DZIs, the PDFs, doing the processing, it's about 60 seconds per page. Uh, this, of course, happens 12 to 16 pages at a time. Uh, so that, you know, we're, we're per piece of hardware, we're generating about 12 to 16 pages uh, per minute. Uh, no orchestration here. The There's no real link between uh, the online site and our local processing, uh, but we can just simply scale horizontally to accommodate volume increases. So just roll out new nodes and point them at different sections and go. Uh, next. And finally, a little discussion. Uh, Jeff was talking about cropping and pre-processing. And as Jeff said, the, 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 the human time to simply crop images is tremendous. Uh, compared to the rate at, that the scanner can, especially the microfilm scanner, can go through the images. So uh, we did some experiments and we found that there is a small benefit to the OCR if you crop the images, but it's, it's actually very small within 2% of uh, confidence when you do the metrics with Tesseract. So uh, although aesthetically, you know, it certainly looks nicer when these images are cropped. If we're looking to scale up volume, we can just simply skip cropping and ensure that our OCR is almost as accurate as before uh, within, you know, a very small margin. Uh, okay, so I guess I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy and he will discuss the uh, website architecture. Hello there. Yes, I've been asked to talk about the website's user experience a bit. Uh, first, maybe a bit of technical information. We're using uh, Drupal as the content management system to sort of manage and serve up the content. It's open source, PHP based, allows us to easily do content authoring. Uh, it's got baked in accessibility features like semantic HTML, area attributes for system tech. And more importantly, it has a very good track record of uh, keeping up to date with security uh, fixes as they arise, which is important for us. And second component behind the scenes is the solar search software. It uh, is what integrates with our Drupal system to make uh, title and full text searching possible. It allows things like phrase queries, Boolean search operators, uh, autocomplete suggestions, and allows us to sort of customize the relevance of different matches based on fields. And another component would be, uh, we use the Bootstrap CSS framework, it's sort of, for the look and feel of the website, speeds up our theme development. Uh, it's known for cross-browser compatibility, responds quite reliably across different screen sizes, desktop, mobile. Uh, again, it has, like Drupal, good accessibility behind the scenes, and it's got several built-in components which speed up development, like making modals, accordions, tooltips, whatnot, easy to integrate into the site. 
I've also been asked to mention that all of our code is publicly shared on GitHub under the MIT license. Our policy has been that all of our applications are freely available to everyone whenever possible. Okay. So given that, I decided last minute to move away from the static slides and do a live demo. This is what could possibly go wrong? All right, so here we have the front page of the site. As you can see, the two main, I guess, sections of the site are our title search and our full text search. Uh, basically, we try to be like a one stop shop for anybody trying to find any information on New Brunswick newspapers whether you're a researcher, student doing a project, or maybe just someone from the general public looking up an obituary for a past relative, for example. So we try to, to maintain a comprehensive index, a directory of all New Brunswick newspapers. We do have a few titles that are outside of New Brunswick as well, but our primary focus is on New Brunswick. We try to keep uh, metadata about you know, all the publications, where they're published, who published them, who the editor was, when it started, when it ended. If it's not ongoing, uh, we track things like the titles, history through time, either location changes, title changes, whatnot. And uh, we also recently added uh, a lot of holding information. So, you know, who has what in the province, and we have provide contact information where it is known. So let us maybe do a live search. So typical newspaper term be something like Gazette. So this will search everything in New Brunswick. So here we have 49 results try to make it easy to filter down your result list. I guess 49 is not very large, but sometimes you could have you know, over a thousand results depending on your search. So you can use faceting and sidebar here to filter by location fields like province, state, city. Uh, if you're looking for a particular holding type, digital, digitized print microform, if you're looking for a particular institution who may have uh, access to the holding, filter by that and by language as well. And these are all sortable. You do ongoing, whatnot. You can show all titles. So there we've taken out the filter in New Brunswick and include everything. So we're up to 840, for instance. So I'm going to go back to Gazette. This uh, is the autocomplete, which I referred to earlier, and give you suggested matches. Uh, you can also put in uh, location terms in here, year terms. So say I wanted to filter quickly by year. There, we're already down to 10 results. So I think I wanted to demonstrate uh, our metadata for the St. John Gazette, just because we have a lot of information for this particular issue. As you can see, we've got our dates of publication, where it was published, how often it was published, and we have a rich, broad title history, all the iterations of the paper since its inception. Uh, certain issues also have a little PDF, it gives you like a visual of uh, sort of like the family tree of that publication, which I thought was interesting. Uh, we'll go back here. Here we have supplementary title you know about. We have a way, if you're doing research, to cite the record. We've got the citation here, which you can one-click copy and include in your document. Uh, if you notice any error, potential errors in our information, you have a one-stop way to contact us. It tells us what 
paper you're referring to. Send us a message, some details. And also I want to talk about the holdings. They're on the right here. So we have our online. Here we don't have anything digitized on site, but we give a link out. So if you want to browse, so in this case, on Google News, we provide that, that link here. If you want to know where to find Microform, got uh, some publicly available options. One at the St. John Library. If you want to know how to get in touch with them, we have a little button here. Provide any information that we know about, address, phone number, maybe an email, contact people. And so, yeah. That is a title search. We've got over citation. All right, let's go back and go to the second most part of the site that gets used would be a full text. So as Jake mentioned, we do a lot of scanning on site and all that is uh, put into digital newspapers which have full text OCR which are indexed with their solar server you do term searching here and give you uh, basically a copy of the digitized newspaper in that open sea dragon viewer let's do uh, hog reeve just because I have an interest in that. So here, similarly, we get a set of results with different facet options. We do have some sorting options to try and speed up the process of finding what you're looking for. Out of the box, out of the gate, it's uh, sorted by increasing, decreasing relevance, I guess. Let's see, I want it to look for let's add some more terms i just want to show some of the the highlighting so this should load up one of those huge pages toolbar here go full screen zoom into that a little better to give you a better idea the detail we have as you can see we got hog dash reeves Highlighted hogs, uh, vociferous, arouse. So that gives you a, an idea. I think we can go maybe. No, that's that's our limit. But you can see you can zoom in quite large. And what else do we want to talk about? So. Let's go back to the home page and basically, if you're curious on uh, which issues we have done uh, the scanning on, we have our results right here, all 104. You can do the search right from here as well. So if I wanted to try a different like blunderbuss. So again, it takes you to the digitized version. I want to mention below the actual viewer, we have a bit of metadata as well, which can link you back to the, uh, the title page with more of the metadata and the holdings information. And here we actually have a downloadable JPEG option and Again, we have uh, the citation. In this case, at the issue level, we have uh, the uh, issue and volume information added to the citation. So, and same as with the metadata, you can report any additional information or errors. Takes you to the form, pre fills in the paper and the issue. Uh, Go back to the title and there's that title again with the holding information and whatnot. Uh, 
let's see, I wanted to show you that we also have a browse option as well. We're going to go with Daily Mail because I think that is the title which we have most pages scanned. Yeah, we have over 7,000 issues for this particular one. So if you just want to do a standard browse, we have everything arranged here by month and year, descending order. We get some faceting here to filter it down some of the, the results. You want to just look at the 1910s, for instance. What's that? <laughs> so move to the earliest. Again, I just want to show you. This is part of the browsing. Here's our earliest issue for that particular paper. And yeah, as you can see for an old 1910s, this one came through very clearly. Just even more zooming. There we go. So yeah, I think. I just wanted to wrap that up there. I think since we're short for time, thank you very much. I'm now going to let Jeff take over. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, yeah, we're uh, that's essentially it. I just uh, want to note there's still a few things on our horizon. Uh, one is we're looking to set up some mapping of publications by town, city, uh, and county uh, in the province so you can actually see where these papers are coming from. Uh, we want to extend our uh, full text searching uh, to contextually to the publication pages. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, it's not development, but uh, the bulk of the project is, uh, is still to be done. That is the digitization of the thousands and thousands of issues uh, we've still to to put up and hopefully that will include the Brunswick News dailies up to uh, what we consider our low to moderate or low moderate risk I guess range um, so that work uh, I guess will <laughs> be going for quite some time to come that's it hey thanks guys it's a lot of great information, and we have about seven minutes for questions. So if anyone has any questions, you can unmute and ask or just drop it in the chat. Karen? Um, yeah, thank you for sharing. This is really cool. Um, I'm curious if you have a strategy for the long term preservation of the newspapers after they're digitized, especially, you know, you're showing how fragile the paper object is. And if you do, I'm also curious at what point you preserve them, if you are capturing the post processing and the cropping in the OCR or preserving the initial scans. Uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, well, the three of us are from the systems unit here, so we're probably not best to answer. Uh, that's been the work of our archivists. Uh, and, uh, um, yeah, strangely, the project was originally goes way back to being a microforms project. So, you know, they were interested in preserving the papers by putting on microfilm. Uh, when we really kicked off the digitization, uh, to be honest, it was uh, to free up space uh, and get rid of papers that we we just couldn't hang on to anymore, that we couldn't preserve them. So uh, there is definitely some consideration here locally to you know which papers we should be trying to hang on to, or you know somebody in the province should be trying to hang on to a copy. But uh, yeah, we right now we don't have uh, you know uh, good storage facilities for those papers that are identified. Um, yeah, I would encourage you to perhaps reach out. I can redirect you after this call uh, to some staff here uh, that can uh, you know, give you more information on what we're doing and how we're doing it. But uh, yeah, I mean, some papers are definitely being jettisoned. Uh, they, they, we just can't hang on to them. We don't have the capacity. Um, but yeah, you know, which ones is it's always a 
it's a tough consideration. Sorry, that doesn't really answer your question, but uh, it's a big problem for us, I think. Any other questions? Cynthia. Um, yes, um, so there was a question that was submitted during the registration process about the idea of retrofitting space for archival projects of this nature. Did you guys have any guidance or advice on that? Uh, yeah, again, I guess that's on the long, long the lines of uh, I'm not the right person to answer that. Uh, I think we probably suffer from the same problem. Well, Evan can speak to that, but uh, uh, space is a huge issue for the archives here at UNB uh, and has been for many years. Uh, so we've been renovating spaces here uh, for archival content, but not necessarily purposefully for newspapers. Uh, a lot of our newspapers uh, have been even moved off site. Uh, we put some in the provincial archives, uh, uh, some in our own off site storage facilities, which are not the best, unfortunately. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know the details, but I could definitely say it's been a, <laughs> it's an ongoing issue that we're constantly struggling with. So. Anyone else? Um, oh. uh, so not sure if this got answered in the session, but I, I figured I'd also reiterate it. It came in the uh, another one of those questions that came with the uh, with the registration. Uh, and they were asking about navigating protocol and ethics in consultation with communities represented in the New Brunswick community, uh, the New Brunswick newspaper project. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I can't say we've got any clear protocols. I mean, the, the original goal of the project or the, the original foundations of the project was digitizing what we had in the building instead of microfilming. I think microfilm has virtually stopped here at UNB and probably in the province for a lot of these sort of things. So uh, we just kind of saw this as the next step for digitizing. Uh, for preservation. So, uh, yeah, I can't say there's been a ton of consultation. There's certainly lots of buy-in around the province for preserving newspaper heritage. Um, we've had multiple meetings and people are eager to come and participate and let us know what they have and, you know, what they'd like to see uh, digitized. But, uh, yeah, there's, there's not really been a lot of, uh, you know, consultation with the papers. Uh, um, I think that kind of builds on the history of microfilming too. It seems like here we we microfilmed anything we had, uh, and that seemed to be okay, um, you know, regardless of who owned the original content. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're we basically just see it as an imaging project. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question very well or not, but well, we're Thanks. right up on uh, two o'clock, so. We're going to have to end it here, but like I said, if there are any more questions, uh, please send them to me and I'll forward them to the, the panelists, including uh, Leah and Mike. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Thank you, Jeff, Jacob and uh, Jeremy for, for presenting. And um, I hope Thanks everyone has us. a good, good afternoon.